So here is going to be a learning curve. And the horizontal axis will be time. The vertical one will be, let's say, understanding. So generally, the curve is going to look like this. And there's two, two points I want you to pay attention to. They're right here. So there is a way to tell where you are on the lear learning curve. And we're going to go through a lot of topics. So there's going to be a whole lot of different things that you need to understand. And so each one, you may uh, be at a different place in the learning curve. The way to tell where you are is basically how you feel. Oh, it's ink to shape. I don't want that. All right. So at the very beginning, if things are unfamiliar, you're probably frustrated. So that might be you at the very beginning. Uh, it's my job to help you get to a place where you're starting to understand things, so you're not so frustrated. So it's my job to get you out of this zone right here. Once you start understanding things, things are starting to click, you're answering some questions correct on either your book or on web work, uh, you start feeling a little better, you're uh, getting more questions correct, you can answer more questions, maybe you're helping some people, so now you're explaining what you just learned to other people, so things are going pretty well. So this is generally where you feel happy because you're doing your homework, you're learning, you're progressing, and uh, you feel like you're accomplishing things. So you generally feel more happy as you're going up the steep part of the learning curve. Now, if you do too many problems, meaning you have a pretty good level of understanding, but you keep doing more problems, what happens after that? You're not going to learn too much more on this topic. You're going to get bored up here. So this is where you start to get bored. So bored, something like that. <clears throat> now, when it comes time for your quiz or your midterm, you really want to be hopefully up here, or at least somewhere higher up on this part of the curve. What you don't want to be is in this area when your quiz is happening. So depending on how your quiz went, you probably have some idea of where you are on different topics. So hopefully question number one that I told you exactly what it was, you should be somewhere high up on the learning curve because I told you exactly what it was going to be so you get up the learning curve relatively quickly as long as you can remember how to redraw that quadrant. But maybe, uh, maybe the arc length was tricky for you. And so maybe on arc length, you were somewhere lower down a learning curve. So what you want to do going forward is figure out where you are lower on the learning curve and get up higher quickly. So maybe arc length, you had trouble with that. So you want to go and look at arc length over the weekend, try to catch up on that topic. Maybe you had trouble converting. So you want to work on that topic over the weekend. So it's your job to figure out where you are lower down a learning curve and get up the learning, learning curve quickly. And just to warn you, if you came from high school, uh, if this is one of your first college uh, uh, quarters, you probably spent a lot of time in high school right in this area. Why is that? Because they have what's called spiral curriculum, where you basically do the same stuff every single year. It just gets a tiny bit harder. So you'll basically never spend time down here, depending on what school you went to and all that stuff. So I just want to warn you, you may not have spent very much time in the lower half of the learning curve for the last entirety of your life. Uh, so just to warn you, you're going to find yourself, even if you're doing well right now, there will be some topics where you find yourself down here. And when you are, you just need to, uh, this is where you have to work hard to get up to the higher part of the learning curve. And you're really the only person who's going to know where you are on different topics. And another thing, you're only going to have a very limited amount of time. I, most of you are probably taking other classes. Or if you're not taking other classes, it's probably because you have a full-time job or other responsibilities. 
So you don't have infinite amount of time to spend on every single section. So what you want to do, you really want to spend all your time right here. So in class, you want to pay attention so that I can get you out of here. And you're just climbing up that learning curve quickly. And when you start to get, you feel like you understand something really well, you don't want to do another 10 problems on that same thing. You want to stop doing that topic and move on to the next topic where you're further down the curve. Sometimes when you're doing homework, especially if you wait to the last minute, you might be down here and then there's really, you can watch the lecture again, but that takes a while. Uh, maybe all your friends who are good at math are sleeping or out of town and you're trying to finish up your homework at night. You could spend a lot of time being frustrated and not really progressing. So you want to be careful and get out of this, uh, the frustrating part of the learning curve as soon as you can. So if that, if that doesn't happen in lecture, you can uh, come to my office hour, you can watch a lecture again, go to the tutor center, get one of your classmates to go over something with you. Uh, so you need to make sure you get out of this frustrating area as quickly as possible and spend all your time right in the middle where you're progressing quickly. I think they call this area busy work. So I generally uh, don't assign too many homework problems. So I pick a amount of homework problems that I think will get you somewhere, will get most students somewhere close to there. Now, certain areas you may think I gave you way too many homework problems and you uh, understood things when you were only halfway through the homeworks and then you still have half of them to finish. So you might feel like some sections have too many problems. And that's just unfortunate. I can't make the exact amount of problems for every single one of you. So I kind of pick a smaller number of problems. Now, if you find that, that you finish the homework problems and you're not quite confident yet, the best place to go is your textbook for more homework problems. So if you're finished your, all your web works and you're still somewhere right in here and you really want to get up to the, you really want to be bored up here, so you're ready for your quiz or your midterm, I'll open up the textbook here. I think I may have it already open. There we go. So we just finished 10 1. So what I'm going to do, uh, the exercises, you can run, go right to the exercises for the ta from the table of contents. So these exercises right here. There's going to be more types of problems than I cover. So I said skip minutes and seconds. So you know, question five through eight right here are all minutes and seconds. So you don't need to do those at all for this class. So you, you don't need to do every problem. I don't cover every single topic th that these exercises do but you want to go and pick problems that are similar to the homeworks and similar to the example problems I did. So we did a lot of conversions. So if you don't feel good about conversions, here's a whole bunch of, they say graph. So they just say graph these right here. That's a lot to graph. You probably don't need to graph all these, maybe graph three or four until you feel like you have a pretty good idea of where they're going to graph to. Uh, here's some conversions. Here's more conversions. I spent a lot of time on that, so those are good extra problems to do. And at the end of this, they have all the answers. So you flip forward three or four pages, and you're going to get all the answers to all these questions. So not only will you know if you're right or wrong, but you'll know what the right answer is, and hopefully you'll be able to figure out how to get to that answer. So this is a, especially if you start on your web work problems and you just keep seeing red all the time, you're not sure what's going on, uh, this is a good place to go to. Knock some problems out here, you can actually see the answers, and then go back to your web work and uh, start, hopefully you'll be able to solve those a lot easier. Because web work doesn't tell you the right answer until you've actually entered it. So you want to come over here if you're getting stuck on web work.
So we finished a bunch of problems on finding the reference angles, but I did not tell you why reference angles are useful. So we'll go over that right now. Before we do that, I don't know if I explained this in your class. Here's the controls for the uh, window right here. So I try to leave the window open, except sometimes the sun wins against the class. <laughs> Occasionally, this quarter, it'll get sunny in middle class. So especially for well, really anybody on this half of the room, you can feel free to come up and close the blinds. Very close to partway. If you want to just do something like this. All right, so we'll see why reference angles are neat. So to do that, I'm going to scroll back to the big unit circle we drew right here. And I'm going to pick, I think we looked at 7 pi over 6. So I'm going to deface my unit circle. I recommend don't do this to your unit circle. Keep your unit circle pretty. I'm going to erase all this stuff in a minute. And I'll go redo all these things uh, on a nice unit circle. So let's say we're thinking about 7 pi over 6. And those are the xy coordinates for 7 pi over 6. The reference angle for 7 pi over 6 is a regular pi over 6. It's that positive angle back to the x-axis. So there's our reference angle right there. And here is the xy values for the reference angle. How are those two? Uh, points related. They're definitely similar. What's the difference between the xy coordinates? So basically all that happens is in this case both of them turn negative but depending on what quadrant our, our angle is in one or both of the xy values would turn negative. So what we're going to do is use the reference angle. It's always going to be the first quadrant. And we're going to use those values and just think about, well, we're in quadrant 3, so x and y are both negative. So it's the same x, y values, just changing the signs to negative. If we were dealing with 5 pi over 6, it has the exact same reference angle, pi over 6. And how would I get the x, y values? I just look at my original square root of 3 over 2, 1 half, and flip it over, and the x value becomes negative up there. So that's how we're going to use reference angles. You just, you're going to use the same values, just make x or y or both negative. So that is how reference angles are useful. And this is true for any trig function, because all trig functions are just based on the different sides. So any trig function so whichever the six trig functions we have trig of theta is always going to be plus or minus trig of theta bar. So if you know for example sine of theta uh, if you know sine of theta bar then sine of theta is going to be either plus or minus that sine value. And that just depends on if you're using you know, the x coordinate, the y coordinate, and which quadrant you're going to look into, whether it's 2, 3, or 4. So I don't want to write the complete rules here, because what we're going to do instead is just use our intuition and redrawing a unit circle quickly and figuring out, oh, well, we're, we need a negative x over here, or we need a negative y down there. So we'll find cosine of 
we'll just do 7 pi over 6 to keep it easy. So find cosine 7 pi over 6 by finding theta bar, the reference angle, then using cos theta equals plus or minus cos theta bar. So I, did, I pointed to the unit circle before, but let's redraw one unit circle here. And 7 pi over 6. So we're going to count in pi over 6's. So the pi is 6 pi over 6. And 7 pi over 6 is just past that. Now it is very useful to know approximately how big pi over 6 is versus pi over 4 versus pi over 3. So I'm going to just draw the, just those three angles out so we have a good idea of how to measure these. So I'm going to cheat and make some, oh that's not a good circle at all. All right, good enough. So there's a pi over six piece of pizza. There's a pi over 3. Of course, there's that shaded in part right there. And that pi over 3 is this piece. And pi over 4. Pi over 4 is usually a little easier to spot because it's exactly half of a quarter, also known as an eighth. So there's pi over 4. So what you want to do is get used to these different uh, size angles so that when I see, oh, it's going to be pi over 6 past 6 pi over 6, what I want to do is draw the way I just did it right here. What I don't want you to do is draw a really big angle like that, because that would really be pi over 3 past 6 pi over 6. So that would be a little bit bigger than uh, you should draw it. So there's 6 pi over 6. We got pi over 6 right there. And of course, to get there, that's our 7 pi over 6. So any questions about this reference angle here and sketching it out? So I'm going through these in a very slow, deliberate way so that uh, later on I'm going to go through, when we find reference angles later on in a couple weeks, I'll just go through really quickly. I'll sketch it out real fast and this will all happen very, very quickly. So theta bar is pi over 6. So cos 7 pi over 6 equals plus or minus cos pi over 6. Now if you got your first question right on your quiz, you can tell me cos pi over 6, hopefully. Uh, yeah, so, so let's graph that. Um, yeah, so that pi over 6, so it'll be square root 3 over 2 comma 1 half. <laughs> so when I bring this down to quadrant 3, both x and y become negative. So we got ne negative 3, square root 3 over 2, negative 1 half. Do I want the x or the y coordinate here for cosine? So cosine is an x coordinate. So I'm picking the negative square root 3 over 2.
So are there any questions on that process that we just went through? So every time I do a reference angle from now on, I'll just do it faster and then faster. So we won't be going at this speed for all of our, every time we use reference angles. So let's do a sine problem. We'll just do sine negative pi over 3. So find this by first finding theta bar. And then sine negative pi over 3 equals plus or minus sine theta bar. So pi over 3 should be pretty straightforward on how to get the reference angle. So I'll give you a minute to draw out your circle, draw negative pi over 3, and the reference angle. And label your, label your point. So any questions about the uh, pi over 3, the negative pi over 3, and then the pi over 3 reference angle? Now here's where it's useful to know approximately how big pi over 3 is. So if I know pi over 3 is, gets me most of the way towards the y-axis, then I can pretty accurately graph out where this is going to be. And at least for me, that helps me remember that this point has the smaller x-coordinate, bigger y-coordinate, as opposed to the point where they're both the same or where the x-coordinate is bigger. So that helps me know this is 1 half square root of 3 over 2. And do I choose, and so I flipped it over. Now do I choose the x or the y-coordinate? So sine is the y, so we're going with this negative square root 3 over 2 for our value.